Hello, everyone. My name is Frane Babarovic. My pronouns are he, him, and I'm a PhD student from the University of Sheffield. Today, I would like to present to you part of my research under the title, The Evolutionary Dynamics of Pigmentary Gray and Non-Iridescent Structural Color Blue in Tanagers. So, as we can see from this single image, birds are extremely colorful group of animals. Going from left to right, you can see almost all colors that you can imagine. And this huge diversity of bird plumage coloration can be put in two broad categories by the way they are produced. <clears throat> so we have pigmentary colors and structural colors. Pigmentary colors are produced by the position of pigment within feathers. The most common ones are melanins. Melanins are stored in melanosomes, which we can see on this cross section as these black dots all around. Uh, on the other hand, we have structural colors that are rather produced by nanostructures within the feathers, as their name say. say. So feather gets specifically arranged so that when light hits it, part of the light gets absorbed and part of the light gets refracted towards the observer. In the case of non-iridescent structural color, this on the cross section, you can see this black layer with designated with them. Those are melanosomes and they absorb the light. But they, by the end, this SP layer is the nanostructure that actually produces the color. So structural colors. Non-iridescent do not change hue with change of viewing angle. So they are different than, for example, iridescent colors, which are those beautiful colors in hummingbirds that change the hue as you change the viewing angle. Evolution of coloration within birds' plumage has been described for pigmentary to structural colors as evolutionary tinkering. That's just a term that I'm going to break down for you today. That means when evolution do happen, novel new structure is not produced by additional elements in the older structure. Rather, older structure gets rearranged with all of its component to a new structure. In this case, in grackles and allies, we can see, <clears throat> sorry for this, we can see that black color and melanosomes from black color get pushed to the edges of a feather structure where they are, are align themselves, arrange their position so that layers can be produced that are called that in the end refract the color toward the observer. And that's iridescent color. Talking about melanosomes themselves, different shape of melanosomes is involved in is involved in a oops, different shape of melanosomes is involved in different colorations. So we have melanosomes whose shape is characteristic for certain feather colors. On this diagram here, we can see a categories of melanosomes for black, brown, gray, iridescent, and finally non-iridescent structural colors. For all variables that are important for their shape, we can see that gray melanosomes overlap in shape with non-iridescent structural color melanosomes. So if you look at the pictures, they are these big and bulky, quite bulky melanosomes, and they overlap and they have overlap in shape. This shape overlap, so common uh, structural component, led us to hypothesize if there is an evolutionary link between pigmentary color gray and non-iridescent structural color blue. Looking more into literature, we found that there is this category of coloration that we designated as slate, but it can be called blue gray, gray blue, slate gray or blue slate, that is identified as a new class of rudimentary 
or weakly nanostructured feathers responsible for slate gray and blue gray coloration. So this broad analysis of structural colors in birds plumage identified this color category. This was argument too that led us to reshape our initial hypothesis saying, is there an evolutionary link between pigmentary color gray through intermediate color slate leading finally to non-iridescent structural color blue. So no direct transitions, but rather transition from gray to slate finally leading us to blue. We wanted to tackle this question. This is point of, this is a hypothesis in my research. And for that purpose, we decided to study Tanagers and allies, Traupide. Why? Because as you can see from these images here, they have plenty of gray, plenty of blue, but they also have plenty of these slate colors. So color that it looks like it's in between gray and blue color. So first we wanted to understand better this in between. So whether slate color is maybe more gray or more blue, or if it is a special completely separate color category. For this purpose, we developed so-called distinctiveness analysis, where we first went to description of colors from Handbook of Birds of the World Alive. It's a huge online data set where you can find detailed descriptions of colors, written detailed description of colors of, in birds plumage. We went through all tanagers and we took out those entries that say gray, blue, or blue, gray, gray, blue, slate, slate, gray, any combination of names. And we made those three categories. So blue, gray, and slate. Following that, because we wanted to understand this issue, this question, we wanted to understand it literally from birds' point of view. What that means? So birds, compared to us humans, have fourth cone in their retina, in their eye, making it for them to see broad, to literally see broader ranges of wavelength, going all the way to UV. This color, this color vision can be shown in the tetrahedral color space, which is this diagram underneath, where literally every single point <clears throat> In this diagram is a color that can be described by four values. So values of U, S, M, and L of four cones. Those are stimul stimulations of retina. And, you, and as you have value, you can plot the color within this tetrahedral color space. We went to museum. We took digitally calibrated images of bird specimens, and we extracted color for crown, nape, mantle, rump, tail, throat, breast, belly, tail, and wings, as you can see on this diagram. Following this, we filtered only those color measurements from digitally calibrated images that are gray, slate, and blue, and we plotted them in tetrahedral color space. You can see it underneath. So as you can see, gray, really small amount of points, slate has extension, and finally blue has a huge extension in a color space. Basically, we wanted statistically test whether these three color categories could be rendered distinct. And this is our, these are our results. So on these three plots, what you see as a single line, is the observed mean value for each color category that we investigated. So slate, slate, and finally blue. The distribution you see is distribution of values for the other color category that we made comparison. In A is gray and slate, and you see slate falls in the distribution of gray, so no distinction. Slate also falls in the distribution of blue, so no distinction. And finally, blue does not fall in distribution of gray, so there is a distinction between these two. Conclusion, slate overlaps with both gray and blue, and more or less 
to the equal extent, while gray and blue are really distinct. This told us that our new form slate color category really is between gray and blue, but not just that, it told us that birds also see it like that. So in the tetrahedral color space that I showed you previously, and you have these three small graphs here, slate is this part of the color space between these two huge chunks of data points. Finally, we are moving to an evolutionary question. Is there an evolutionary link between pigmentary color gray, true intermediate color slate, leading to non iridescent structural color blue? How did we approach this topic? So, first, we did character coding for 319 species of tropia. With zero, we scored that there is no color of our interest present. With one, gray is present. With two, slate color is present. And finally, with three, blue color is present. We did all of this for 319 species of tropid, of tanagers and allies. We took phylogeny of tanagers and allies from Yetz et al. And you can see on the side that phylogeny did plotting with, uh, with coding on the end. So we, we went there and we were like, yes, I see gray, this bird is gray. This bird has blue, this bird has slate, or there's no color of our interest. We plotted that. We used phylogeny, which I described here. And finally, we decided to do analysis in bias traits. We used reverse jump multi-state analysis. I know it might sound complicated, but I'm gonna just tell it really quickly for you what it is. This analysis basically allows us to quantify <clears throat> transition rates between our characters in a way that it tests all the possible transitions. So you see our four characters on these schematics here, and these lines represent everything that can happen there in evolutionary terms. So zero can go to one, one can go back to zero, zero can go to two, two can go back to zero and all the other combinations you see. Why this worked for us? Because we feed it into the algorithm. And if it turns out our hypothesis as present, as likely to happen, that means that our hypothesis is correct. Just to repeat for you, our hypothesis was zero to one, one to two, two to three. That's what should happen. So gray evolves to slate, slate evolves to blue. Let's see. So we had several, uh, we had, I'm gonna guide you now through our results. And as you can see here, out of all the runs we did with our algorithm, if there is low percentage, it's really not likely to happen. So if you see this bar really low, that transition is not happening. You can see it here for 0, 3, 1, 3, 3, 1, and 3, 2 through all of our runs of the algorithm we did. And you see high percentage that's really likely to happen. So let's break down our results. First, not likely to happen is blue color evolving from any other color, blue color evolving to slate. So in our pathway reverse from blue to slate and also gray color directly evolving to blue and back. That's really not likely to happen. So it seems our hypothesis at this point might work. Let's move on. So we have two results that are very likely to happen. That's zero to two and two to zero. So slate color, there's high chance that it might evolve outside our pathway. So from any other color to slate and back. Finally, where you see these bars really high is the following pathway. So any other color to gray and back, gray to slate and back, and slate to blue. So no back, just slate to blue happens. This confirmed our hypothesis as a true. Interestingly, we also discovered that blue color is equally likely to evolve to any other color. So within Tanagers, blue color can evolve to some other color, which is 
something we did not investigate further, but I think it could be an interesting question. So just to repeat for you, gray color evolves to slate, slate evolves back to gray, and slate evolves to blue. And within Tanagers, this is the only way by which you can evolve color blue. Finally, this blue and gray painting by Mark Rothko, I know it for more than 10 years, and I really like it. And as it is called blue and gray, I always notice these two big panels of blue color and gray color. And as much as sometimes, because I work on colors, uh, art inspires my science. In this case, actually, results from my science inspire the way I see art because never before I was able to actually notice that besides these two big panels, there's a huge amount of slate all around them. I interpreted this in my head that in every blue, there's a bit of gray and slate, and in every gray, there's a bit of blue and slate. As a conclusion, slate color is part of the color space that shares average properties of blue and gray, the most common pathway for evolution of blue color in Tanagers is from slate color and evolution and other evolutionary pathway to blue is highly unlikely, but this color category could equally likely evolve to some other parts of the color space. Slate color could have independent evolutionary origin, which I think is really, really interesting avenue for the future of this project. I would like to thank to Gavin Thomas, Chris Cooney, Thomas Guillermo, Nicola Nadu, who were my collaborators on my project, and every one of you for joining and listening to my talk today.